WordCamp Europe, you have made it to your almost final thing of the day until we uh, have our organizers up here and then have an after party uh, right in here, if I recall correctly. For folks who are still looking for seats, it looks like we might have a group over there available. There's some on the left side. If you're coming in from this side and can't find a seat, then over there is your target area. If you can't find them, there are volunteers that can help you. My name is Josefa Hayden Champosi, and I'm your executive director of your beloved WordPress open source project. And I am here to introduce us to our next speaker, our final speaker, Matt Mullenweg. He is the co-founder of the WordPress Open Source Project. I feel like he almost doesn't need any um, introduction, but in the event you would like to get your minds uh, ready with some questions afterward, he's going to have some thoughts for us, and then a little bit of Q&A afterward. Um, there are microphones here and here for the time that that happens, and I believe that there's one floating microphone if you cannot make it. I heard a yes. I, all it takes is one yes. Excellent. And with that, my friends, join me in welcoming Matt Mullenweg. Let's see. Let's see. Ciao. <laughs> Torino has been amazing, hasn't it? Like, what a great city. Thank you, European community, for choosing this as our, where we're going to be this time. Where I'm from in Texas, we say howdy, <laughs> which is nice, because it's got a little W in it. Um, I am very excited uh, to talk to you all today, because um, I want to go through some of the things we've been doing in WordPress and then also share some thoughts, um, expand a bit on the thoughts I had at WordPress's 21st birthday. So, but we're going to start off with, uh, you know, WordPress is really, oh, I should also say, if you want to tweet, we got the WCEU hashtag is the official one, and I'm at Photomat, P-H-O-T-O-M-A-T-T, -T, on Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, whatever the kids are using these days. Um, the... Uh, WordPress is built by all of us, and a big part of, of how that works is uh, bringing new people in. So we have something called a, a Contributor Mentorship Program. Uh, this has a fairly new program, but we've now had 55 graduates of it. Are there any here in the room? Maybe stand up if you graduated from this. Oh, yeah, yeah, stand up, stand up. <laughs> So if you would like to be able to stand up at the next WordCamp Europe, <laughs> like this fine gentleman, thank you so much. What was your name? Giuseppe. Oh, Giuseppe. Yusep, Yuse sorry. Joseph, Joseph, Yusep, Yusep. Um, then uh, please scan this QR code, check it out. Um, we have this program going that uh, people report way more confidence. I think we went from like 54 to 80% confidence in contributing to core and everything through it. Um, also, some of y'all were involved in the Contributor Day two days ago. Stand up if you're at the Contributor Day. This should be about 800 of you. <laughs> or a little less than a third of the camp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We had important fixes for MIME types. Playground launched new projects, including MySQL, SQLite export with uh, WPCLI. There's been so much cool stuff that happens at Contributor Days. If you want to learn new skills, if you want to get better at WordPress, if you want to be more involved with the community, uh, make it uh, as well as use it, get involved. Uh, Contributor Days are one of the best ways to do that. We also had a ton of translation um, happening. so. There are 9,194 active polyglot contributors in European languages. And on Contributor Day, we had 66 people who translated more than 21,000 strings. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. 
they are the reason I was able to say ciao to you when I came on stage. <laughs> and maybe more in the future. Uh, we've also got some fun new translate stuff. Translate Live is an alternative way to translate plugins and themes on translate.wordpress.org. Click on the Translate Live link, and it will open up the plugin that you're planning to translate. Can you all understand The plugin that? will be loaded using the blueprint that was provided for the preview functionality in the plugin directory. You'll see strings available for translation highlighted and can right-click them to enter your translation. The translated text will be reinserted so that you can see if it works well in context. This way, you can focus on translating the most visible strings first. When you're ready, submit your translations back to translate.wordpress.org. You'll find them in the waiting section. If the plugin author provides multiple blueprints, you can switch between them to translate different states of the plugin. Here we can find the plugin in the state where it already has been configured and can thus focus on translating it without having to go through setup steps first. So basically what that was showing is combining Playground with Live Translate so you can see the translations happening in line. What, was that audio coming through okay? Yeah, it was okay, okay, it was a little booming up here. The other project I want to give an update on, these are awesome ones. I have a little bit of a, uh, sad trombone one, though, which is the Data Liberation Project. <laughs> so as I spoke about at State of the Word, I'll reintroduce Data Liberation. This is the idea that one of the best things we could do as an open source community is unlock all the proprietary platforms, all the places where people have their data locked in to systems which might not allow export or easy composability or transferability of their data. Um, so we, we term this Data Liberation. And uh, if you scan that QR code uh, or go to wordpress.org slash data dash liberation, you will see we have the start <laughs> of what uh, hopefully will be something that creates a ton more freedom on the web and a ton more portability between platforms, including in and out of WordPress. WordPress could be a, maybe a middle ground between something else. Um, however, this has had very, very little progress. <laughs> so if you go to that page, click on some of the links. You'll see mostly empty GitHub repos. So I just wanted to point this out as an amazing place, if you're interested in contributing to WordPress, uh, to adopt something and have total ownership of it. So if you want to sort of each of these projects is fairly self-contained. So if uh, you want a chance to actually lead something within the WordPress project, you could be in charge of the, say, Wix to WordPress converter or something like that. Um, this, I think, is also going to be really important for us as the more and more marketing dollars, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars are spent in marketing for proprietary platforms. Proprietary platforms have gotten tons of investment in the past few years, things like Shopify, Squarespace, et cetera. And they are coming as sort of the macroeconomic conditions have changed. They've started to really target WordPress agencies, WordPress users, WordPress sites quite a bit. And so they're coming and trying to snipe away our community. Um, so we have to. <laughs> Keep an eye out for that. And the problem as well is when people go that way, it's almost impossible to go back the other way. It's like, uh, I don't know if you had this advertisement here, but the Roach Motel, the roaches check in, they don't check out. That's a lot of these proprietary CMSs. They let you check in your data, but you can never check it out. So if part of our mission to democratize the web and increase freedom, I think it's really, really important that we create portability, even when the platforms themselves try not to allow it. The other big part of this that I think is also super relevant for this audience is we need to make WordPress to WordPress easier. <laughs> Who's ever tried to transfer a WordPress site to something else or done an import or export and it didn't go perfectly well? <laughs> or you needed like five plugins to like update the URLs and the attachment pages and the ID changed. And you know, God help you if there's an encoding error. <laughs> and now all of a sudden your umlauts become something else. Um, WordPress to WordPress, I think we can make uh, much, 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 much stronger. Um, one thing that could help this actually is some of the work that's happening with Playgrounds. WordPress Playground is going to change everything. First up, the WordPress Blueprints Community Gallery. Blueprints are JSON files that you can use to configure a WordPress Playground instance. Each blueprint contains custom instructions used to set up WordPress, install plugins, and themes, set site options, and even import starter content. The Blueprints Community Gallery is a growing space to test and share these blueprints contributed by folks like yourself. We all know the famous five-minute WordPress install, 
followed by a five hour setup. Blueprints carve a path towards a five second WordPress install and setup. It's quite revolutionary. Next, use the new WordPress Playground plugin to start a private local sandbox of your site. The WordPress Playground plugin runs a copy of your site directly in your browser. You can test theme and plugin updates, even install new themes and new plugins. Any changes you make here are contained to your Playground instance, leaving your website or blog unchanged. So feel free to play. From WordPress CLI support and GitHub pull request integrations, WordPress Playground is leveling up WordPress as we know it. So with Blueprint, you can imagine you could create sort of a, a predefined set of how a WordPress could work, including dozens of plugins, anything, and put it together. I will also say that we're trying to think of a new name for Blueprint. So I want to tap into your collective creativity a little bit. Um, the cool thing about Playground is it's playful. It's fun. Uh, there's this idea that we have the sandbox, right? So Playground and sandbox go well together. Blueprint feels a little more architectural, <laughs> a little more serious. So if you have an idea for a cool, fun thing we could call Blueprints that are not Blueprints, let us know. Because as they say in computer science, there's only two hard problems, uh, naming things, caching, and off by one errors. Wah, wah, old joke. <laughs> we have some fun stuff coming up, too. As soon as July 16th, we are going to have WordPress 6.6. Um, one of the features I'm most excited about here is that there'll be rollbacks for auto updates, meaning that the, uh, yes. <laughs> Again, one of the things that really distinguishes WordPress from many other platforms is our investment in our update system, which means everyone can be on the latest and greatest. Uh, so this improves it quite a bit. We also have a ton of improvements to Gutenberg. Uh, if you haven't tried it out, please check out the new grid system and grid blocks. You can do some really, really cool, interesting, visually creative layouts. Uh, we've got shadows, negative margins, just a few different things. Uh, easier grouping. You can apply styles to groups. Um, some pretty fun stuff coming in 6.6. Um, and the thing that I'm most excited about as well, as someone who spends a lot of time typing in Gutenberg, is as promised at the state of the word, we have improved the performance quite a bit. <laughs> as of 6.5, which came out a few months ago, is now five times pa faster on every key input. Um, I think this is also a good model that we should think about for all parts of WordPress and how we do development. And if you're doing plugins or something like that, what are the key performance metrics that you can look to, literally performance from the, the client side, to make everything as fast, take as few clicks as possible? Uh, if you want to check it out for Gutenberg, these are the, what we call the Gutenberg code vitals. So, and this shows specifically like how long it takes the first page to load, typing in a container, the pattern load times, everything. So we're really going to every single part of the interaction and really relentlessly trying to optimize every bit of it. Um, because no one's ever said I would like my site to load a little slower. <laughs> and it's actually kind of funny if you use, like, the typing was really driving me crazy. Because who remembers like typing on like an old like Atari or something? <laughs> People have actually measured this. Some, some of these programs have faster input response times than modern web applications. And uh, I didn't want WordPress to be one of those. So that's why we did a lot of work on this. Other cool thing that's coming soon um, in Gutenberg that I'm excited to show you all is the zoom out view. So as you know, people are now, with Gutenberg, we've gone beyond just the page. We're moving to, you, know, you can build the entire website with it as a phase two. And now you'll be able to zoom Composing out. pages with patterns from a zoomed out perspective reduces the granularity of editing while simplifying arranging, removing, and styling of entire sections of a page at a time. This provides much more confidence that a design is visually appealing all the way down the page. The idea here is that this experiment could become a page creation flow within WordPress, where you have the option to compose pages with your patterns. So this might look like a WordPress dashboard to you, but did you also know this is the hottest new eSports platform? Yes, indeed. The Speed Build Challenge is taking over the world. <laughs> uh, scan that QR code. You can check out Jamie's uh, YouTube channel. I believe Jamie is here in the audience somewhere, 
Where are you? Da, 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 right there. It's Jamie Marzo. Say hi, everybody. <laughs> So what a speed build challenge is, and who was at the live one yesterday? That was pretty fun, wasn't it? It's basically a competition where two people try to build something using Gutenberg. Um, I would love if we could even expand this to maybe be like, maybe like a CMS Olympics or something. <laughs> like let's, let's start competing with other CMSs where they bring their champion and we bring our champion or gladiator and like we go toe to toe to try to solve some customer problems. I think that would be kind of a fun, uh, sort of fun way to, to push the state of the art forward. Um, and I love stuff like this. I think this is also important as we think about how we reach new generations of users, as we expand the marketing and reimagine how growth is going to work in WordPress, that we do more of like not just telling people, but actually showing them what they can do. Like what would the equivalent of like one of those reality TV shows that you kind of, they come in and fix up your house, what would that look like for your websites? <laughs> and how can we share that? Or like what are other fun things we can do to just kind of like, you know, show what WordPress really has an impact of. And better yet, while you're showing, you're actually teaching. Because one of the most powerful things um, that our community has ever done is we've taught hundreds of thousands of people at this point CSS, PHP, how to code, a little bit of HTML. And gosh, I learned to code from WordPress. <laughs> and to continue doing that for a new generation, particularly using things like Gutenberg that are so much more accessible, um, I think it's a great entry point. Um, but we've been doing this a little while. In fact, we just celebrated our 21st birthday recently. <laughs> in the US, in my blog post, I was like, now WordPress is old enough to drink. And all the Europeans were like, huh? <laughs> Apparently, you have different ages for that here. Um, but in the US, that is, is the age, the other big age in the US. So the next big milestone for WordPress for me will be 25. That's when its car insurance will get cheaper. <laughs> be able to drive around the web uh, for less than it currently does. Be easier to rent a car. Um, but I can't believe how many years we've been doing this together. And I stand before you now, 40 years old. <laughs> Started when I was 19, the co-founder with Mike Little. And, uh, Man, what a journey, and how much the world has changed over the past two decades. And it makes me very, very excited about how much it's going to change over the next couple of decades. And really got me in kind of a, a contemplative mode, thinking about, well, wh what are the things that we've done in the past and the things that I think we should do in the future that maybe we're not emphasizing as much right now um, that might have changed over the years? So uh, like Martin Luther nailing his thesis, I decided to... Uh, come up with a list of 11 things, which I'm going to talk you all through right now. Uh, the first principle that I think we need, we do, need to really keep in mind is that simple things should be easy and intuitive and complex things possible. So this is the challenge of technology. And in fact, um, I think a lot of like, amateur product designers will be like, well, you need to pick an audience to build something for a prosumer or a beginning user and separate them or segment them. And, but if you think of the very, very best technology, the one that impacts all of our lives, maybe the one like the smartphones in our pockets, they do an incredible job of being something that can be intuitive for new users and very accessible and works all the way up. I love how Apple now, they do that little flex at the end of all their, their keynotes in WWDC and they say shot on iPhone. Sort of showing that this camera that you, know, you can buy for a couple hundred bucks and, and is very accessible to like a billion people in the world, um, you could actually make like a cool keynote looking slick video and they fly it around on drones and they do a, it's actually, if you look up the setup they use around the iPhone, it's hilarious because there's an itty bitty iPhone then there's like this many lights and stabilizers and everything. So they definitely put some pro stuff around it, but um, WordPress is that. It can be used for the simplest small website and it actually powers some of the largest and most complex websites in the world whether that's some of the biggest targets or highest needs for security, like the whitehouse.gov or other government websites, or sites uh, that have hundreds of thousands or millions of posts, page views, orders, other things. Like, it's incredible how much it can scale. And I believe that when you make your code poetry <laughs> and you uh, design it in an elegant way, you can create something that works for both. 
got me thinking about blogs a lot because we got started just as a blogging system. But I want to remove that just because I would actually say that I'm getting a little bored with a lot of websites these days. <laughs> and I could imagine, it's hard for me to imagine a website, whether it's for a business or anything, that wouldn't be improved by having a blog on it, a really good blog. Also, that dynamic sites are better. And by this, I mean that, like, yeah, it's easy to make a static site. And yes, there's a million ways to spin up, like, you know, pages on GitHub or whatever. You have a static site. But then it's, you have a static site. Who wants a static site? <laughs> you want a dynamic site. You want an exciting site. You want a WordPress. You want something that's going to be change, adapt to your users, that they can comment on, they can interact with, and one that you, as the author or the publisher, are making interesting, giving them a reason to come back, giving them a reason to subscribe. You know, don't just create a website. Create a community. If there's any lesson you can take from WordPress, it could be one that. And so I really want to challenge people, even making these business brochureware websites or something, like, what can you do? I guess maybe it's a website for a restaurant, and all they want is their, to put their menu on there and you know, list their hours. But if you're building that for them, challenge them a little bit. Say, hey, let's go in the kitchen. I bet you know, your chefs have some really interesting stories. How did they come up with this recipe? What's, tell us about, you know, why don't you highlight a customer a month? <laughs> Who's your favorite customer that comes in? Put them on your blog. Like, you can brainstorm hundreds and hundreds of ideas. And this is what the web needs more of. This sort of like, I think particularly as like AI starts becoming like the Wikipedia, the answer answerer of everything, this sort of like more personal content, what some people have coined the cozy web, is gonna become where people are more and more drawn to. This next one is around uh, sort of the WordPress website. Uh, I'm saying documentation should be wiki easy to edit. Um, actually, when WordPress documentation started, it was on a site called the Codex. We called it codex.wordpress.org, and it was a MediaWiki instance. So we inherited all the cool stuff that comes from MediaWiki. So we kind of had like a WordPress Wikipedia. Um, so that meant every site had an edit button on it. If you click around wordpress.org today, you will not find very many edit buttons. So how do we bring that back, like literally, uh, where we make could we have all of WordPress.org have an edit button on it? And maybe the edit button takes you to a GitHub code. Maybe it takes you to a Gutenberg dashboard where you can change things. Um, something I think we need to develop here that I'm pretty excited to get out there because I'm just kind of shocked it doesn't exist in the world is the idea of a moderated wiki. So a lot of wiki software goes a little stream where like every edit just goes live, including the Wikipedia and other things. So they have to do a lot of like post, um, you know, cleaning up spam and stuff like that. But I think there's a cool middle ground, not unlike how WordPress comments work, where things could be moderated by default. And so as a setting, you could change that. But by default, it goes into a queue, and you can just kind of look at it and approve or deny, just like a comment. And it can run through a gizmet to check for spam, just like a comment. So I think this could be a really interesting model for not just WordPress.org, but a ton of websites around to invite more contribution. Again, don't just make a website. Like, make a community. Make something people can participate in. The other part of that is forums. I want forums to be more front and center. And actually, we already changed some stuff around this on WordPress.org. But um, when kind of about a few weeks before I was writing this, I'd gone and I was like, OK, where, where's like, what are people talking about? What are the questions people are asking about WordPress uh, right now? Um, because I'm trying to actually every single day since I've been back from my sabbatical, um, I've been doing some customer support uh, across different products at Automatic or going on like you know, reading things on Twitter. And so I was looking for the forums. Like, what are people saying in the forums? And it was really hard to find them. <laughs> it was buried behind, like, five different clicks. And there was, like, a, we were trying to put people to support documentation and other things. And, and yes, let's be innovative. Let's maybe, even, like, make a Wapu bot that answers questions you could chat with. Uh, but let's also give a place for where people can talk to other people. And let's not just do it for... WordPress, but let's do it for every single plugin and theme. <laughs> so I want to give every plugin and theme the infrastructure that WordPress itself has uh, to create a little community around it. Because you know, we created this taxonomy where there could be sort of solo plugins, community plugins, and commercial plugins. And we've actually had less adoption of the community plugins than I thought. But then I went back and I was like, oh, huh. Like, wow, do you hear that rain, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought, oh, yeah, that first version. I remember writing this code where like, we would actually uh, 
the, the original plugin system would kind of spin up like a little track tag when it spun up your subdirectory in the SVN and then set the access files and everything like that. So basically, we were giving everyone almost in a fractal way exactly what WordPress was using to create itself. Um, but today, you know, WordPress has an amazing Slack. If you're a plugin author doing a community plugin, where's your cool Slack? <laughs> right? So. Uh, Things in this line, I'm sure there's a lot, but for example, every sort of you know, community plugin should be able to just press a button and get a Slack channel. And then you could send your users there or invite people there. And you can have a little place where you can chat with other developers or plan things or you know, use our community infrastructure um, to you know, make the plugins just as vibrant for collaboration as, uh, as Core is. And actually, my friend Nick Hamsey uh, gets on me on this about a lot. Is uh, we have some amazing themes in the directory, and the preview still is that little boat. Thing. It's terrible, <laughs> and it breaks, and it doesn't always work with different things. And also, we, our guidelines and the things we feature um, are in kind of a narrow, narrower aesthetic than I think um, represents the wealth of creativity and art and everything around the world. So there's a very old ticket about this. Literally, metawordpress.org ticket number 30. <laughs> I don't know what our latest number is, but it's, it's not 30. <laughs> so this is, is not a, a new idea, uh, but it's an oldie but a goodie. And especially with things like Playground, what can we do for theme play previews? And what can we put in the hands of theme authors to really show off um, not just the default content, but maybe like something really, really cool. Um, how can we give, and by the way, this should extend to things like the screenshots. Like how do we make screenshots amazing and dynamic? How do we make them translatable? Maybe how do we make it so if they're looking at, if they're browsing on their phone, they're seeing phone screenshots instead of desktop screenshots. Like there's so much you can do there to put more power into the hands of plugin and theme authors. And yes, before you ask, this will include some more analytics. As we evolve the plugin and theme directories, we can't over-index for guidelines and requirements. Um, this is something that happens in uh, any system that evolves over time. Um, but basically, boundaries in functionality and design are meant to be pushed. Uh, I'll bring up a silly example here, but it was one I really liked, which is one of my favorite WordPress themes of all time. And it was a command line theme. So you'd load the website, you could turn this on, and you load it, and it was just kind of like a like blinking like terminal. And uh, you could type help, and it would give you commands. <laughs> you could type post, and it would give you the recent post. And it almost kind of like a, a theme version of WPCLI. Um, so weird. So cool. Does not comply with any of our guidelines on the theme directory. <laughs> and uh, this particular theme, I, oh, I forget what happened with this particular, but basically like, this is not something that would be allowed by our normal review processes or other things like that. So it's good that we evolve our guidelines and we try to push the best practices of what a plugin and theme should do. And that's important for our community. As well, I think we need to have a button where like a plugin or theme author could say, uh, here's why the rules should not apply. <laughs> And that shouldn't be based on who you know or something like that. It'd just be on the coolness of the idea. And the, also, like, the potential harm. So, of course, zero tolerance for spammy behavior or spam or anything like that. That's an important rule. But if you want to do something kind of weird and quirky, but it doesn't necessarily support whatever our latest blocks are or template parts or something like that, like, okay, but is it really interesting? Is it unique? Like, let's allow that. And I think that would make a really dynamic and cool theme directory. Um, because again, I want to make the web a lot weirder <laughs> uh, and more unique and more personal. I want it to reflect people's uh, aesthetics more. Like, I bet you know we've got about 3,000 people here. Um, if I were to sit down in your living room or you invited me into your home, there'd be a lot that'd be very different about that. Every, there would be no two alike in this entire room yet. I bet if I loaded screenshots of a lot of your web pages, actually, probably not in this room, but if I loaded screenshots of a lot of web pages in the 43% using WordPress, um, might not be able to tell them apart. Or they might be very much in, in a similar sort of like a minimalist, you know, sans serif aesthetic. 
as we evolve the directories, I think a lot about feedback loops. So things that can scale with the usage of the entire community rather than being reliant on gatekeepers. So, you know, in marketplaces, if we, there's this old idea from Eric Raymond of the cathedral and the bazaar, like are you controlling what gets in or are you kind of allowing something very open, bazaar-like? Um, so you do that, but you also need feedback loops. Right now for plugins, for example, the only feedback you get if you're choosing between five different plugins is kind of like the, down, or the installs, the rating, and I guess we have the support resolutions, right, in the forums. Um, what else could we put in there? Uh, and how could we make it so that doesn't have to be manual, like we have volunteers or some centralized team going through and tagging everything, but maybe uh, something people can tag within their dashboard. Um, uh, how can we push some of this actually in terms of scaling this? How can we make all this feedback, the feedback loops that might give feedback on plugins or ratings or saying this works with other, this works with this or this breaks with this other thing or this is accessible or not or whatever it might be or this doesn't work well in my language. Um, let's not just have that happen on WordPress.org and the Rosetta sites. How do we actually push that into the application, into WP Admin? So that we can, you know, people can click buttons in WP Admin and give us this feedback. I like this block. I don't like this block. This did what I wanted. Um, and then that goes back into some open, transparent system that developers can see and other users can see. So again, it encourages great behavior. It was a radical idea. I had this kind of like fever dream where I was like, well, what if the plugin review team wasn't reviewing the plugins before they went in the directory, but actually the job of the plugin review team was to write the first review for every new plugin. It's a little weird, right? But imagine, like, if you make something new on GitHub, it doesn't have to go through a centralized team that approves it or not. Um, what if anyone could just create a plugin? Uh, but, you know, after you upload some code into it, we'll come through and we'll give you your first review. <laughs> might be a bad review. It might give you one stars if you're doing something that's not great or we, we see a lot of obvious security vulnerabilities or something like that. And ideally, some of this can be driven by AI or, or automated checks, like the plugin uh, check that was talked about in the presentation yesterday. But um, it's kind of an interesting idea. I was actually inspired a lot by one of the early stories of Flickr, uh, where it was, I believe, was it... Uh, Heather Champ, um, and I think Derek Prozek wrote about this in a book, where in the early days of Flickr to bootstrap the community, the employees would actually go to every new user and comment on their first couple photos, <laughs> just to give them that first comment, that first interaction. And so I think about that a lot. Like, it's a little lonely sometimes when I see a bunch of plugins. We have actually a bunch of plugins that have zero reviews. And uh, what can we do to nudge them a little bit? Again, that's sort of a generative community thing. It's a flywheel that'll bring us a lot closer together. I want to make core really opinionated and quirky, too. <laughs> so we've removed most of the Easter eggs from core. <laughs> we, we've had some interesting ones in there. Uh, there was one that, one of my favorites, uh, the Matrix one. Have you all heard about it? Who's seen the Matrix Easter, Easter egg? A few people. Uh, so we decided to allow, normally, because when we added the revision system, um, you know, you can compare two revisions to each other. So you can say, what's the difference between this version and this version? And you, know, you can kind of select them, just like MediaWiki, actually, I think was the UI inspiration there. But we allowed you to compare a revision to itself. It's like, ooh, what happens then? <laughs> well, what happens then <laughs> was your screen would go black, and you'd start to get sort of something inspired by that scene in The Matrix, where it's like, wake up, Neo. <laughs> It'd be like, wake up, username. <laughs> Uh, follow the white rabbit. I forget what it said or something like that. Um, this is weird. <laughs> this is funny. Uh, two, there's two problems with this, though. One, we removed it. Two, I don't know if any current contributor to WordPress could get that in. How do we unlock people who are contributing and participating so that we can do some weird and funky stuff? <laughs> And you know what? Maybe it breaks something. Maybe it doesn't translate well. Maybe the one in a million times, maybe someone gets really mad at us on Twitter about it. But you know what? I want WordPress to reflect our own personalities as well. I want it to be fun to contribute to. I want it to be fun to participate. And I want it to be fun to use. And so um, we got to spice it up a little. <laughs> Number 10, if you make WordPress, use WordPress. So, <laughs> I think it's really important that everyone involved with developing and making decisions for the software 
is using it themselves. So restart your blog or personal web page. You know, I'm trying to model this myself. I've been blogging sort of in the past year more than ever. Uh, get in there and play around with it. Um, I think there's no better way to have the empathy for what we're trying to create. And you know, when I look at, I'm not going to talk about WordPress here, but in other teams and other software when I've looked at it, um, when I've noticed things kind of go off a bit from usability, which then starts to show up in uses metrics and other things down the line, then I talk to the team, I'd be like, well, how much do you use XYZ? And often the answer is, I don't, or I haven't, or I have no reason to. And so think of a reason, find someone. If it's not you, find a friend. <laughs> Set something up for someone, uh, you know, a loved one, ideally. So that when they call you with a bug, it's, it's really, <laughs> you know, when Charlene calls me and says, oh, I can't update my, it's my sister, by the way, uh, says, oh, I tried to do this and it didn't work. I'm like, oh, you know, I feel that. It hits in a different way than reading kind of a generic user review or tweet. Um, so uh, if you make use WordPress, use WordPress. And the final thing, which is kind of related to this, and, you know, in WordPress, we go to 11. Wow. Hey. Y'all don't watch the same movies in Europe that we do in America. <laughs> what, that's, was that Spinal Tap? Yeah, Spinal Tap. Check out Spinal Tap. It's a really fun mockumentary. Um, number 11, it's important that we stay close to our end users, that we all do to support, that we go to meetups and events, anything we stay, do, can do to stay close to the everyday people who are on the other side of the screen. And you know, like I said, every single day since uh, I've been back from my sabbatical, um, been looking at different support things. Um, I do a lot of reading of all the, I'm, I might be the number one listener of all the WordPress podcasts and blogs and newsletters. And, and I like to go to things like this and the meetups and watch the YouTube, Jamie's YouTubes and other things. How do you, can you embed yourself in um, how people are reacting to it? Uh, so if we were to do these 11 things more, I think there will be a renaissance and WordPress. Um, and I'd be very, very excited to come to the WordCamp after that as well. Because <laughs> these are pretty fun already, and I'd be very curious to see you know, both how fun it would be after some of this, and also maybe what uh, new types of people we'd attract to the project. Um, you know, some of my uh, ancestors are from New Orleans. There's something they call, is it a la la -nip? How do you pronounce that, la -nip? It's a little something extra. L-A-G-N-I-P-P-E, I think is how it's spelled. Lane Yap. Oh, thank you. That must be from French or something. Is that French? No, it's just New Orleans. <laughs> okay. It's a little something extra. So the idea is of, of a baker's dozen, you know? So you get one extra one, a 13th. You buy a dozen, you get a 13th. So I decided to add one extra one to this list. And uh, you're probably not going to be surprised. But Playground is going to change everything. <laughs> it's... Uh... It's, it's really wild, which is being enabled by this technology. And I know I started to talk about it. Um, gosh, Adam, when, when did we first start talking about this? Where's Adam, by the way? There's Adam, by the way. <laughs> so thank you, Adam, for <laughs> bringing Playground to us. And November 23? Yes, yeah, so it hasn't been that long. November 2023, is that? Wow. Because I know I, it was the thing I was most excited. 22? Or 22? Yeah, that sounds more right. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I know it's been like two state of the words already. <laughs> uh, you saw some of it there. You know, go to wordpress.org slash playground, play with this. WordPress.com just launched a fun thing where you can have like a studio so you can clone sites immediately. What you're going to be able to do with Playground is going to be very, very, very exciting. I think it's going to transform. Gosh, I was just brainstorming like, you know, customer support because I've been in it a lot. And, um, I'm sure there's a lot of WordPress business owners in here that do customer support. Uh, what if instead of having to go back and forth 10 times with people and saying, hey, can you deactivate this plugin? Can you do this log file? Can you do whatever? You could just say, hey, can you send me a link to clone your site? And in 10 seconds, you immediately have a full copy of their site running in your browser. You don't have to worry with logins or like sharing passwords or anything like that. Like, wow, that would make support a lot easier, wouldn't it? That's the kind of thing that's going to be enabled by stuff like Playground. And I think, um, I was saying earlier on the 
was it Kraut, Kraut Press podcast? Um, playing with Playground today feels most like in the history of WordPress um, what it was like, like committing that first version of uh, you know do action and you know actions and filters essentially to WordPress core. Um, and the only thing that existed at that point when we added actions and filters was Hello Dolly, which still is there, represents the voice of a generation. But Hello Dolly, it's, it was like the simplest possible plugin, you know? And, uh, but I was like, at that moment, I remember thinking like, gosh, I wonder what people are, I think this plugin system, actions and themes is like, or actions and filters is like such a cool paradigm. It's way cooler than object oriented. Like, what are people gonna do with this? And now 60,000 plugins later, <laughs> <laughs> and themes, my mind is continually blown by what y'all do with <laughs> uh, actions and filters. Very, very simple thing. Playground feels like that. Like I'm seeing it today, I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. There's a few demos, like there's some fun stuff we're showing you, we've got studio, whatever. But I'm like, man, what are people gonna do with this? <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's where I'll leave it. Now I will say, there's been a lot of talk you know, at some previous WordCamps as well about like, ah, this was a little bit like, oh, things are going wrong. What's, you know, what can we change? Everything like that. Um, so I, I did want to just take a moment to note uh, that after a little bit of flatness, WordPress is growing again. <laughs> Which is very cool. As you might have seen in public stats, including some of the internal stats we saw, uh, things had flattened out uh, for about a year. And we talked about this a lot, we worked on it, and that work has now uh, come to fruition. So uh, I'm very, very, it's actually picking up in a really interesting way. Um, it'll be exciting to start putting a few more points on the board here again in our march uh, to free the web. You know, we don't have to be 100%, but we could make at least you know, 85% of the web really free, and then force all the proprietary people to open up with data liberation, that would be a pretty good, you know, life goal. You know, there's always a point in this presentation, um, you know, for WordCamp Europe in particular, when uh, we talk about what's coming next. But actually, the organizer's gonna tell you. <laughs> so you have to stay around for that.